All right, so last class we left off describing basically from beginning to end how transcription occurs. And we'll be finishing with its application with respect to diabetes, but also talk about it with respect to anabolic steroids today. Up to this point, transcription, when we talk about transcription, it's helped to kind of define a few key phrases here that we either will talk about in this class or you might come across in your readings. Transcription is the, the process of producing that mRNA transcript uh, that relates to a specific gene. When we talk about gene expression, that's typically referencing uh, to the regulation of transcription, um, whether gene expression is uh, increasing or decreasing uh, the mRNA transcripts or subsequent expression of that gene. Um, and so when we talk about uh, MODI today, the specific form of uh, diabetes, that's gonna be our application point, one of them, um, it's gonna be, Talk, we're going to be focusing on regulation, on gene regulation, not necessarily transcription. Uh, and also anabolic steroids, the way by which they work is specifically acting on gene regulation or modifying gene regulation. Uh, so we have not yet talked about anabolic steroids yet, but anabolic steroids. So uh, anabolic steroids, anabolic typically means like the building up uh, of uh, taking many small pieces and building up into something. Uh, catabolism uh, is the process of breaking something down into its smaller subsequent components. So anabolic steroids is uh, the process of building up, uh, in this case, lots of protein. Um, there are lots of side effects that occur as a result of anabolic steroid use. Um, there, yeah, there's, uh, there's not enough time for us to dive deep into all of these, but the take home point from this slide is that antibiotics, uh, antibiotic steroids have a lot of side effects that go along with them that, uh, that occur across multiple organ systems. While there are all those side effects, uh, why take them? Uh, Cause there are pronounced benefits specifically as it relates to performance. Uh, athletes use them particularly to increase muscle mass uh, to increase strength, uh, their output, as well as decreasing their recovery time. And in some purposes, there's a benefit to increased aggression. Um, but beyond the recreational use that might be illicit in some uh, sports organizations, there's actually some therapeutic use for people who have um, growth, growth deficiencies. Um, also, because steroids are a hormone, uh, typically, there's also help with um, either postmenopausal post declines uh, with their bone density. There's also issues with anemia or inflammatory diseases that the use of steroids can be helpful. So, what we're first, we're, what we're going to do first is we're going to talk about gene regulation and set the stage for it as it relates to prokaryotic gene regulation, and then we'll take. Well, after that, we'll go ahead and try and focus on eukaryotic gene regulation. Um, and I'll try and make sure that I'm going to be as clear as possible in defining what system we're in and what are the overlaps or how they differ. And so we're first going to try and focus on bacterial gene regulation. And we're going to do that by first focusing on uh, the use of lactose, which is um, milk sugar, and how that can be used during metabolism for bacteria uh, or how its use for energetics uh, is kind of regulated at the genetic level. And so typically, uh, there are pumps that help uh, shuttle lactose from the outside of the cell to the inside. That pump here is called a galactosidase permease. And so this step one, this pump is key for getting lactose inside, um, inside the bacteria. Um, lactose is a disaccharide, it has these two sugar units. And so to use it, uh, bacteria need to break it down into its, uh, or uh, it needs to go undergo catabolism here to break it down into its two subsequent components into glucose and galactose. And there's an enzyme that does that, uh, beta galactosidase. And so galactoside and per, uh, galactoside permease and beta galactosidase are two key th components that are needed to break, to bring in lactose and break it down to get glucose, which is key for the, uh, metabolism of bacteria.
So one key thing to note here is that the expression or the production of these two key components, um, it costs energy to make them. It's not, uh, there, there's, there's an energetic cost to making them. And so you wanna ensure that when you wanna express them when they're needed. And so there's gonna be a regulatory mechanism that controls regulation of uh, galactoside permease and beta galactosidase where their expression is regulated so that you only express them when they're needed because there is an energetic cost to making them. And so the way in which that happens is uh, there's an actual model that helps to try and explain how this works. It's called the Operon model. And so we talked about how there we have these transcriptional units for eukaryotes, for us, one transcriptional unit equates to one gene, but for prokaryotes, one transcriptional unit can involve multiple genes. And so here, when we have is we have uh, an operon where that's uh, that's when there's within one transcriptional unit there are multiple genes that are present that all work together that are regulated together and that also work together towards some specific function. And so what ends up happening here is that in this operon here, this is called a lac operon, lac for lactose. Uh, it create it has multiple genes that are uh, encoded within this operon that all work together to uh, to promote the shuttling in and breaking down of lactose. Within it is beta-galactosidase and galact uh, galactoside permease. Transacetylase is another, uh, another enzyme that does a different function. But here the key thing is that these two, uh, this enzyme and this transporter are all are expressed within the same oper operon uh, and are regulated together. And, be, and what ends up happening is that when this lac operon is transcribed, it's one transcriptional unit. So when that means there'll be one single mRNA transcript that's produced that encodes for each of these, for lac, the lac Z gene, lac Y, and lac A, which is each of these components down here, they're within this mRNA transcript. But there's multiple, multiple genes present within this mRNA transcript. When there are multiple genes within one transcript, we call that a polycystronic mRNA poly for many. Uh, and so it's usually a polycystronic mRNA is when multiple genes are encoded uh, within that one transcript. And this is only within you, uh, within prokaryotes. Uh, typically for eukaryotes, we have monocystronic mRNA where our mRNA typically encodes for one gene. And we typically don't have operons where there are multiple genes within one transcriptional unit. We have one gene for each transcriptional unit. And because of that, our mRNA is monocystronic, it's not polycystronic. So within this operon, within these multiple, oh, yes, go ahead. Yes, because it's, it's, it's a eukaryotic cell. And so it, there's within every, every transcriptional unit, even within a red blood cell, one, transcript, one tra transcriptional unit is one gene. So within this operon, uh, there's going to be different kinds of genes present within one transcriptional unit, and so there are going to be some uh, there are going to be some genes that help uh, promote the expression of an enzyme or a protein of interest. Those are going to be structural genes. Those are going to be key for achieving the actual function of that uh, of what that operon is key for. Uh, but in addition to that, there are going to be some regulatory genes that are really key for controlling the expression of the of the structural genes. And so uh, what, what they're gonna do is that these regulatory genes will encode for some regulatory protein that'll then come back and act on the operon to regulate the expression, expression of these key structural genes. Bless you. Um, for the regulatory genes, some of them might be, might, some of them uh, might actually lie outside just outside the operon. Um, and again, just to remember, we're in the prokaryotic system here. So we have a circular DNA genome. Uh, we don't have, uh, and so it's, when we talk about it just lying outside the operon, it could be just adjacent on the other side of a promoter. And in this case, um, that's what's gonna happen here. And so we have a regulatory gene just outside of the operon here called lac I, which is a regulatory gene. And so, one thing you may have noticed that's on the operon that we haven't talked about yet is an operator, which is just downstream from or next to the promoter. Uh, 
And what ends up happening is that there, that is a site at which proteins can actually bind to this operator and can inhibit transcription. So that's the key function of what the operator does. It's a sequence that's just um, between, it's just downstream from the promoter. So between the promoter and the first structural gene, and it's the site at which proteins can come on and bind and regulate transcription to alter, uh, to alter ex uh, expression of the transcript for that operon. And so operators can be defined by these specific co consensus sequences where these repeating nucleotides that define the operator uh, and these proteins, again, the operators are bound by proteins that in, can regulate transcription. So whether uh, when you, whenever we talk about proteins that bind to DNA, they're binding to and recognizing specific sequences, consensus sequences that they have an affinity for that can regulate transcription. And that's what's happening here. So within the LAC operon, uh, there's going to be the regulatory gene express uh, will encode for a repressor. So repressors are going to be binding to the operator and inhibiting the operon, inhibiting transcription of that operon. And so this is an example of negative control of transcription because, this, because of what this protein is doing. It's actually physically and sterically binding and inhibiting transcription from occurring within this operon. Now, what's going to be key here is that the way in which this is regulated is really is really pretty key. So we talked about how we only want to express uh, uh, beta-galactoside and galactoside permease when lactose is present. So what ends up happening here is that we have this repressor. Again, the repressor binds to the operator and inhibits transcription of the lac operon. In the presence of lactose, what ends up happening is lactose will bind to this repressor and it'll inhibit the repressor. It'll inhibit the inhibitor. And what ends up happening is that that will enable subsequent transcription of, of that lac operon. So this lac I gene will express, uh, will encode for the repressor protein. It'll be on the operator to inhibit transcription. When lactose is present, it'll bind to that repressor protein It'll induce conformational change that'll then prohibit it from binding the operator. And now RNA polymerase is able to bind to the promoter. Uh, it'll enable transcription to occur, and we get expression of beta-galactosidase and galactoside permease here. And so when lactose is present, we get the expression of this key transporter and this key enzyme that enables lactose to be used for the formation of glucose and the, um, the key substrate for energy here. So what's key here is that, uh, that this is an example of a catabolic pathway where the lac operon is using lactose to break it down for energy. Uh, there are also anabolic pathways where, uh, the, again, the catabolic pathways are breaking things down. We're going from lactose uh, down to uh, glucose and galactose. But there are also anabolic pathways that are controlled similarly. Uh, and so that's going to be the next example that we talk about. And so... Before I move on, are there any questions on the lac operon, on operators, repressors, et cetera? Yes, I'll go here and there. So far, yes, we are only in bacteria right now. Right. Or Yes, so far we are only in bacteria. That specific repressor we were talking about is for uh, the lac operon. So that was, it, it is encoded by the lac I gene. Uh, it's not, again, it's not, um, these regulatory genes can be, or not, but are not necessarily required to be within the operon. And in this case, the repressor protein is not. It's just outside or upstream from the promoter. And so, um, but this is a general, if we wanted to like zoom out um, from just the lac operon, these operons are regulated by some sort of, uh, by some sort of regulatory gene that encodes for a repressor sometimes, that can encode for a repressor. So 
Yeah, so typically because the genome of, of prokaryotes are smaller, they're uh, typically like these regulatory genes or the, the, op, the, the operon will encode for like many, a single transcriptional unit will encode for multiple genes at the same time. And so there's this tightly regula regulated path, um, tightly tight regulation that occurs because of the limited, the act that's, there's like an actual limitation because the genome is so much smaller. And so there's going to be typically for an operon, typically some sort of regulatory gene that's involved. And we're going to talk about, uh, instead of breaking something down, the next, the next example will be an anabolic pathway and how that's regulated um, with, through a similar operon model with regulatory genes. All right. Yep. So oh, the next example we're going to talk about is, um, is tryptophan. And so the key thing here is that if enough tryptophan is, uh, is produced or is manufactured, uh, if you have enough of it to meet some sort of energetic need, you would want to stop the production of tryptophan and not continue to producing it. And so um, what's going to end up happening here is that we have different operon, the trip operon for tryptophan. And so this is uh, what's going to end up happening here is there was, I actually think I may have forgotten to mention one thing. I did, forgive me. I'm going to take one step back because I just saw that. Um, for the lac operon, the expression of the genes within the operon are induced by the actual substrate, in this case, lactose. So this is called substrate induction, where the substrate itself, the target of the enzymes, uh, it will actually be inducing the expression of this operon. So this is called substrate induction. <laughs> the opposite um, is going to be end product repression, where in this case, the trip operon will actually encode for multiple enzymes that help with the formation of tryptophan. And so what's gonna end up happening is that for the trip operon, we're gonna have RNA polymerase that's gonna be able to bind and promote the expression of each of the five enzymes. They're gonna be transcribed and then subsequently that mRNA is gonna be translated into the enzymes that produce the formation of tryptophan. What's going to end up happening here is that there's going to be a regulatory gene that's further upstream outside the operon that encodes for some repressor. In this case, so we had the lac operon where the uh, repressor was always active and then it was inactivated by lactose. It's going to be switched here. With the trip operon, the repressor protein is inactive at rest, basically. But once enough tryptophan has been produced from these five enzymes, tryptophan will then bind to the repressor protein, and now it'll be active. So once there's enough tryptophan, this tryptophan will bind to the repressor protein. It's now active, and it'll bind to the operator and stop transcription uh, or expression of the trip operon here. So this is an example where the end product here of what this operon is encoding for is coming back to repress this, to repress it. We call this end product repression, where the product that's being produced from this operon, with this whole the whole function of the trip operon is to make enzymes to make tryptophan. Once there's enough tryptophan, it's going to come back and repress this whole operon. So I'm going to do one quick review and then I'm going to open up for questions. So I lost my slide. There we go. So in the lac operon, we had a substrate, in this case, that was lactose, that was binding to the repressor and making it, uh, uh, making it unable to bind uh, to the operator and allowing transcription to occur. And so that was, again, that was uh, substrate induction. Here for the trip operon, we had end product repression where the product, in this case, tryptophan from, uh, that's being produced, or sorry, uh, the product, the trip operon is encoding for the enzymes that's producing tryptophan. And so now that final end product is coming back and acting on the repressor to turn off the trip operon. And so this is end product repression. Both of them involve negative forms of regulation, but just uh, end up in different, uh, end with different outcomes. Now I'll stop for two or three questions. There, so I'll go um, first. Hey, can we go back to the last one? Um, are there repressors that can be 
Can you say that one more time? Uh, there were pressures in Catholic press for only specific schools. So like could have press for uh 50% of the Gotcha. So not really because all of these enzymes are encoded by this one transcriptional <laughs> unit. So they're all regulated together uh, at the transcriptional level. Um, and so when you have typically in the prokaryotic system within one unit like this, if you're expressing tryptophan E, you're going to express D, C, B, and A all together. And it's, it, it kind of makes, if I remember correctly for tryptophan synthesis, like you want all of those enzymes. They're needed for actual tryptophan synthesis. And so there's, it's kind of a, an efficiency of, of um, it's an evolutionary efficiency that's occurred over time where as long as you, if you're going to have, you need all five. So it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any benefit to only having three of them or two of them, if that makes sense. Yes. So negative regulation meaning in this example, in the trip operon, there is negative regulation by the repressor on the operon. So the repressor here, like it's it's binding the operator and negatively regulating the expression of the trip operon, which is all these enzymes. In the lac operon context, we're having negative regulation on the repressor itself, where lactose binds to the repressor and uh, is inactivating it. That's a good, that's a helpful question. Yes. So, is there ever like a, a regulator which binds the um, operator, which is not a repressor, and like activates it somehow? Or they all we'll get we'll get to that. That's uh, hold that thought. That's a good thought. Last question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is there ever a like the opposite of here? Is there positive like that for that was just his question, and we're, we're going to get to that. So hold on to those thoughts. All right, so positive control of the lac operon. Uh, so as you can as you can imagine, um, we're going to talk about this in great detail when we get to the metabolism unit uh, for quarter four. But glucose is key to is the, is the key substrate for bioenergetics. And so the pathways that uh, use glucose as a substrate for energy are constitutively expressed, meaning they are always expressed. Uh, what ends up happening is that uh, we, if what what we end up what ends up happening is that if glucose is present, we would want to turn down these other pathways like lactose metabolism because there's already enough glucose. However, if glucose is not present, if it, if it's not if there's not sufficient concentration of glucose. We would want to turn up the pathways that leverage other uh, energetic substrates like lactose, where we can take lactose and derive glucose from it. And so these pathways are going to be pretty tightly, these other pathways are going to be pretty tightly regulated. And so this lactose pathway can be upregulated or downregulated based on glucose concentrations as well. And what's going to be key is that there's going to be a, a second messenger that might sound a little familiar to you guys that it, where its concentration is going to be dependent on glucose. So when glucose concentrations are up, cyclic AMP expression, uh, cyclic AMP concentrations are going to go down and vice versa. When glucose concentrations are down, cyclic AMP will be up. And the reason why that's really key is that cyclic AMP will form a complex with something called CRP, the catabolite regulation protein. Uh, from here, we're just going to call it CRP. So what ends up happening is that when glucose concentrations are low, again, cyclic AMP will be up. And as a result of that, cyclic AMP will be able to uh, form a dimer with CRP. And the two of them form a complex that bind to the CRP site here, just in front of the promoter. And it acts like a transcription factor for the lac operon. And so transcription factors... Uh, Again, they are basically the opposite of these repressors where they help encourage or promote transcription. And so the formation, so when glucose is low, cyclic AMP is high and it dimerizes with CRP to form this complex. They bind to the CRP site that increases the likelihood of RNA polymerase to bind and you get subsequent transcription of the, 
of the LAC operon to express the, the transporter and express the enzyme necessary to use lactose as a substrate for glucose formation. So <clears throat> what's key to remember though, is that again, the operator, uh, the repressor that'll bind to the operator here, uh, if there's enough lactose, it'll inhibit or negatively regulate the repressor and glucose concentration will need to be low. And so it's helpful to test yourself. We're not gonna do this now, but uh, with all the free time, I imagine all you guys have, uh, when you just wanna test yourself real quick, you can use this slide to help kind of walk through the thought process of um, what happens in certain circumstances with the lac operon as it relates to the CRP, cyclic AMP complex, as well as the repressor protein. So there are a few more key terms that we're gonna try and define before we move over to the eukaryotic system. Um, there are the regions that are around the promoter, uh, like the CRP site, like the operator, um, those are gonna be called cis acting elements because they're uh, fairly close to the promoter and helping to uh, regulate uh, that uh, the events that are occurring near the promoter. Uh, but then there are gonna be elements that are acting. And when we talk about elements, that's why it's underlined here, elements typically re specifically refer to DNA sequences or uh, uh, pieces within the DNA. So whenever you hear cis acting elements, you're going to be thinking about, you ought to be thinking about pieces of the DNA, pieces of the genome, pieces of the DNA that, in this case, since it's cis acting, acting close to the promoter, the CRP site and the operator, things like that. Um, there are also going to be other regulatory genes that are often called transacting elements um, because they exist further away on the DNA. Uh, in this case, they're further, uh, further away on the circular DNA from this specific operon. And so, they're gonna, these are regulatory genes that have their own promoter. So typically, uh, typically regulatory genes, we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, in one second, I'll get to eukaryotes here. The, I'm saying that out loud because I wanna jump that way because that's, uh, that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, the, the trans acting elements are gonna typically be under control of a totally separate promoter uh, and so that's going to be the definition by which we define a transacting element within the prokaryotic system. They are under control of their own promoter, but encode for a transacting factor. So remember, elements are for DNA. In this case, a factor is specifically referring to some sort of protein that's going to then act on uh, or bind to the cis acting elements. So, for example, with the um, trip or lac operon, the Trans acting elements were either the uh, lac I gene or the uh, other uh, repressor gene that encoded for the repressor proteins. So those regulatory genes were the trans acting elements. The proteins that they expressed were trans acting factors. So elements or DNA factors or protein that, and those factors are acting on the cis acting elements, the CRP site, the operon. Now, within the regulatory elements within the eukaryotic, eukaryotic system, it's going to be a little different in terms of scale here. Or what I should say is, uh, in terms of scale, when I say close or far away, it's going to uh, that's a relative term between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and you'll see why in a moment. So the basic principles apply as well here. There are cis-acting elements and transacting elements and transacting factors. Uh, but what we define as cis-acting or transacting is going to be a little different here. So the transacting factors or proteins here are transcription factors. We've talked about those already. Those are proteins that bind to the DNA that promote transcription. They bind to regions of the promoter. They bind to the cis-acting regions that promote transcription. Um, however, what's going to be key here is that within the eukaryotic system, cis-acting elements are often much further away than um, it within the eukaryotic system. So. Previously, when we talked about cis-acting elements, they were pretty close to, uh, not too far away from the operon um, for eukaryotic DNA, because we have so many different chromosomes. What ends up happening is that cis, bless you, cis-acting elements are thousands of base pairs away, uh, further away on the chromosome, but typically are on the same chromosome. 
Uh, and so that's what we typically define as uh, a cis acting element. And any tr given transcription factor can be involved uh, uh, in promoting the transcription here. And so the, so again, the key difference here is that the, defi the, the, the definition of closeness is different here, where cis acting elements can be thousands of base pairs away, but are just typically still on the same uh, linear stretch of DNA. And typically trans acting elements, these uh, that are encoded for transcription factors, are usually on can be on totally separate chromosomes, but those transcription factors are expressed and come and act on certain regions of the DNA. So what that looks like here, as an example, is for eukaryotic genes, we have some sort of stimulus. And this stimulus will uh, induce the uh, transcription at a trans acting element. And for context here, below here is our gene, our uh, region of DNA of interest. So stimulus A acts on a totally separate chromosome where this transcription factor is encoded for on this transacting element. So then we get this transcription factor and it'll then bind to our uh, gene of interest and promote transcription. There'll be another stimulus that'll then also promote the uh, transcription at a totally separate transacting element. We'll get a second transcription factor. And so the second transcription factor might bind to the might bind to our gene when both transcription factor A and B are present. So when both are present, polymerase will RNA polymerase will bind and we'll get X number of transcripts as a result of that. With only transcription factor A, we'll get less transcription occurring because typically the more transcription factors you get binding at the promoter, more transcription is occurring. It's increasing the likelihood, or should I say, it's like decreasing the threshold necessary for RNA polymerase to come and bind. So you can think of, again, this is like to try and simplify it, more transcription factors equals more transcription or yeah, I'll say that. Uh, before I move on to the next slide, I'll pause for a couple of questions here. Are there any questions? Yes. At that at that specific gene, yes. Whereas if there's another situation or circumstance at that same gene where more transcription factors are coming in, you'll get more expression of that gene. And so it's actually possible, and I'll show an example in two slides where um, what it actually looks like when you look at um, if you look at how genes are displayed mm -hmm. online, where they show like where transcription factors can bind, you can get transcription factors coming in and working in concert. Sometimes they actually might be inhibiting each other a little bit, but I'll uh, that's just to try and um, give you a preface to what we're going to talk about in a couple slides from now. So again, we have uh, for cis control elements. Again, these are on uh, on the same linear strand of DNA. These cis control elements. Now there is a distinction between those that are proximal versus those that are distal. Typically, the ones and this is uh, just for con just for context, what we define as proximal or distal. It's a little. It's it's not a hard and fast rule here. Uh, at least what we're just what I'm displaying on the slide here. But this is like a general rule of thumb. So typically, proximal control elements are those that are within 100 or maybe even sometimes 200 base pairs that are either upstream or even sometimes downstream from the promoter. And so we have uh, we have our promoter here, whereby perhaps there are uh, regions of this of the DNA that are just upstream that might help promote the transcription here or inhibit the transcription here. Um, but then there are also distal control elements that are further away, that are uh, more than 100, 200, sometimes even thousands, tens of thousands of base pairs away from our gene of interest. And what ends up happening is that the key thing to note here is that biology exists in a three-dimensional context. So when we talk about DNA um, and how our DNA is packed into the nucleus, our DNA is just not, it's not like a single long um, skinny strand, um, especially when we have so many chromosomes. What ends up happening is that our DNA is compressed and compacted into these chromosomes. Um, and what ends up happening is that these distal control elements within a single chromosome, even though it's thousands of base pairs away, again, this is like a three-dimensional context, they're being folded on top of each other. Like you can think of a slinky where 
if you stretch it all the way out, we can probably get a slinky from that wall, maybe to you guys at this desk over here. But when we compact it, all of those distal parts are close together all of a sudden. And so what ends up happening is that there are elements that are far away. Uh, and if you know, we could think of a um, certain amount of base pairs on a slinky, but these elements that are super far away all of a sudden get close when it's compressed and compacted. And some of them are actually able to act on and regulate transcription of a gene that's thousands of base pairs away. Those that enhance the transcription of a gene that's far away from it are called enhancers. And those that repress transcription are called repressors. And so what we have here is that this DNA is bent because again, our DNA is compressed. So a distal control element is looped over and regulating expression over here. And it has, and because this is gonna be an enhancer, it's gonna regulate by uh, recruiting in these co-activators that will increase the likelihood of TF2D to bind to the promoter and promote um, RNA polymerase to bind and uh, transcription to occur. So our proximal control elements are those that are fairly close, just a couple of hundred base pairs away from our gene of interest. The distal control elements are hundreds to thousands of base pairs away, but are able to act because again, the, the physical structure of DNA where it's bent and compressed, these distal elements are able to uh, fold over and act on uh, our gene of interest. Yeah. Yeah, so the things that we're talking about here on this slide, these are all cis control elements. So they're all on the same, basically chromosome here. They're all in the same linear strain of DNA. Whereas the transacting elements in the eukaryotic system are typically on a wholly, totally separate chromosome. Um, so like if we have gene X of interest, or yeah, like if we're interested in gene X and its expression, its transcription, um, there's gonna be transcription factor A that maybe binds to it and regulates it. And this is on chromosome one. Transcription factor A might be encoded over on chromosome 11. Um, and so it's a transacting element that comes over and regulates uh, our gene X of interest at the promoter site. But these cis control elements are on, typically like on the same chromosome, they're on just further down that linear strand of DNA. Yeah. Yeah. So these You're talking about the distal control elements here? So these distal control elements, what's going to end up happening is that they're going to increase they're not going to be binding to repressors here. What's going to end up happening is that they are going to be, in the case of an enhancer, um, will be increasing the likelihood of transcription factors and TF2D of binding to our gene of interest and promoting its transcription. For repressors, they're gonna end up, uh, they're gonna end up either encoding for a repressor gene, or again, this is a physical, this is a within the same strain of DNA. This is a physical, we're in a three-dimensional context here. They might fold over and inhibit the ability of transcription factors to bind at our gene of interest. And so it's a matter of what typically these distal uh, control elements um, can have other proteins that bind to them that can either inhibit or promote transcription. So like in the case of the example here, this enhancer region binds to these co-activators that increases the likelihood of TF2D and subsequent RNA polymerase binding of the promoter, but enhance uh, repressors might will likely do the opposite but they're gonna be DNA binding uh, proteins that come in and bind at these distal control elements, but end up repressing or inhibiting gene transcription. But the activators The what, sorry? The activators and systems, they're to be The, the co-activators are actual, are proteins, are, are bound to the enhancer region. It says enhancesome, that's just like, uh, you can think of that as a large region of enhancers at that specific locus, at that specific site in the DNA. So, yes, that second, that second strand, so the far left side, where the activators are part of it, yes. certain nature. Okay. In that case, that's just a proximal control element. But it's just, I'm just going back. So, those activators are an example of a cis control element that's going to be uh, helping to recruit more, uh, increase the likelihood of RNA polymerase to 
bind downstream of the gene of interest. Does that help? Okay. All right. We're in the home stretch here. So if you look on the NCBI site and type in your the favorite your favorite gene of interest, what you can end up looking at is uh, you're going to be able to see the likelihood of transcription factors that bind to that gene of interest. And so this is from pulled from a publication that came out of one of the labs here at UVA, where they had a panel of transcription factors of interest, and were able to see, or genes of interest, forgive me, and they were able to see where they're along specific consensus sequences, the likelihood of transcription factors binding. Uh, and there, the color coding is down below. But what's key to note here is that this like up into the right arrow is the start point of transcription. And so what you'll end up seeing is that there's going to be a bunch of sites to the left upstream from uh, upstream from the start point uh, on the on the promoter. There's also some that are downstream. There's going to be some sites that there's uh, green and yellow where they might be overlapping or adjacent to each other, where they might be working in tandem or synergistically, or there actually might be cases where they might be um, working against each other uh, and inhibiting transcription occurring at that site. Um, but this is just an example of what it looks like in a research setting when we're trying to study and understand the likelihood of transcription factors that bind to certain genes of interest here. So to bring this all home uh, and apply this back to the con uh, to diabetes and anabolic steroids, um, Modi has a few different um, mutations that occur that have subsequent phenotypes or behaviors or presentations that emerge from those specific mutations. The one that we're going to be focusing on is uh, a genotype or a specific um, gene expression pattern that constitutes the majority of it where this HNF factor is going to be uh, undergo some sort of mutation. What's key to know is that with HNF, that's hepatic nuclear factor. And it's usually a transcription factor that's going to uh, bind when it's only a dimer. Uh, and that's going to be regulated by this other factor called DCOH, dimerization cofactor of homeodomains. It's the last time I'm going to say that. We're just going to call it DCOH. Um, so again, uh, HNF is a, new, a transcription factor that can only... Transcription factors bind to DNA, again, and promote transcription, but it can only serve as a, as a transcription factor when, it is, when it's a dimer. Um, DCOH is a protein that's required for some transcription factors to dimerize and associate with the machinery. And so, as you can see here, as you can imagine, HNF relies on DCOH to become a dimer. And so, uh, that's basically what I said. So, what this looks like here is that HNF, hepatic nuclear factor, is going to exist in these monomeric forms. Um, and DCOH is going to be a homotetramer. It's going to be four pieces that are all together. What ends up happening is that in the presence of HNF, uh, DCOH will release two, two units and enable um, HNF to come in to form this heterotetramer. And that is now able, now the HNF is present in a dimer here on the right, hand, right half side, it's able to function as a transcription factor. Uh, what's key here is that this is a key transcription factor for insulin. So once HNF and DCOH forms this heterotetramer, it can serve as a transcription factor and promote expression of insulin. Now, what's key, oh, yeah. So I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself a lot here today. Uh, and so since it's a transcription factor, it can promote this pre-initiation complex that RNA polymerase II is recruited to and promote expression of the insulin mRNA and via translation that mRNA can, will encode for the insulin protein. What's key is that in Modi, there are there is specifically a mutation on HNF on the hepatic nuclear factor that inhibits HNF and DCOH to come together. So what ends up happening is that because HNF has this mutation, there are lots of different mutations that that are associated with Modi, but some of the key mutations that occur are at this interface between where HNF and DCOH would physically come together. And so what ends up happening is that because of that mutation, this heterotetramer cannot form, you don't get a transcription factor that uh, emerges as a result of that, and you get uh, and you do not have insulin tra uh, transcription or translation as a result of that. So as you can imagine, since there's no insulin being produced as a result of that, a really effective treatment for Modi is insulin treatment. Um, Modi is typically under the classification of type 2 diabetes, but 
it is one of the few instances where within type two diabetes, um, insulin delivery uh, alleviates the pathology. Um, you can also take oral hypoglycemics and it'll kind of work from a two different from a few different angles. Um, from the small amounts of insulin that can be produced, uh, it can promote insulin release through indirect means, uh, but not specifically by enhancing transcription. Um, you also have biguanides, where it'll inhibit glucose release from the liver. Um, and so trying to slow down uh, insulin or slow down um, glucose concentrations from rising within uh, the bloodstream that hopefully will help promote insulin binding to the receptor. Um, other alternatives are pancreatic islet transplant or pancreas trans transplant. Pancreatic islets are these like small units of the pancreas that have a, like a little community of cells that include the pancreatic beta cells. And the hope is that if you can just uh, implant enough islets that hopefully you can have functioning beta cells that can uh, produce insulin uh, or just an entire pancreas transplant. Uh, in the last three minutes, uh, we are going to talk about steroids and how this relates to transcription. So steroids have this uh, pretty common structure of these hydro hydrocarbon rings where there's uh, a six ring, six ring, there's three, six, uh, three six ring structures and a five ring structure. And so it's simply very hydrophobic. So it is able to pass freely through membranes. But what's key to note is that uh, because it's a hormone, it's typically um, transported through our bloodstream. It needs something to carry it since it's hydrophobic. So there's a really abundant protein in our blood called albumin. Um, albumin is pretty key serving a few different functions. It helps drive uh, control osmotic gradients. It can help with the isolation of some, um, some pathogens, uh, not pathogens, but some uh, foreign factors and opsonize them and kind of sequester them. But it's also really helpful as a hormone carrier. And so our steroids will be typically carried by, out, by binding to albumin across our blood. And once it gets to its targeted uh, cell of interest, it'll pass through and act on intracellular, inside the cell, intracellular receptors. And so what ends up happening here is, again, um, in this case, we're going to be talking, the exam example will be uh, glucocorticoids. And so steroids will pass through uh, our cell membrane. And there's going to be th these receptors that have an inhibitory protein on them that can uh, inhibit the activity of this uh, glucocorticoid receptor. Once, excuse me, once a steroid binds to the glucocorticoid receptor, it in releases this inhibitor. Uh, and once that happens, this inhibitor, or sorry, this receptor with the steroid on there is actually now a transcription factor. So it'll uh, translocate to the nucleus, bind to the region of DNA uh, that it targets and promote transcription there. And so what's key is that in the context of steroids, of anabolic steroids, um, one synthetic steroid, uh, one synthetic anabolic steroid is called anadrol. And it, the steroid receptor that it binds to is called androgen receptor. And so what ends up happening um, is that it'll bind to androgen receptor and it'll function as a transcription factor and promote transcription of a targeted gene. The difference between anadrol and uh, natural hormones, in this case, testosterone, um, is that this will bind more strongly to the androgen receptor than testosterone. And what ends up happening is that uh, that there are typically these tra post-translational modifications that uh, help regulate testosterone binding to the androgen receptor and releasing so that you don't get um, some of the adverse side effects through just natural testosterone. But there's usually uh, end product repression where what the gene that it encodes for that androgen receptor is binding to and promoting expression, it'll feed back and help promote the release of testosterone from the androgen receptor, and that's end product repression. But because anadrol binds more tightly to the androgen receptor, it's hard, it's less likely to unbind. And because it's less likely to unbind, you keep getting transcription as a result of that. So what happens next as a result of anadrol? Um, it's, it serves as a transcription factor, but what does it target? It targets, targets IGF-1, the insulin-like growth factor one. And in the presence of IGF-1, we get 
large amounts of protein synthesis and cell growth. But in addition to that, um, it helps inhibit protein degradation. And so the scales are balanced for massive amounts of protein, um, protein development. Uh, and as I mentioned before, there are also some actual therapeutic effect or therapeutic uses for it where, um, where there are growth deficiencies using just IGF-1 is able to help, but it's also able to be used as a performance acting, performance enhancing factor. Uh, and it can also contribute to pet size where typically in Great Danes, they have high levels of circulating IGF-1 and usually smaller pets like a Chihuahua usually have lower concentrations of IGF-1. Um, if this interests you, there's uh, lots of folks who are pursuing transcription regulation as a area of research. I went two minutes over, forgive me, but I'll be up here if you guys have any questions.